Okay, here we are again. Welcome again, everybody. I hope you had a good break because now we are in our nearly final session. We want to communicate the most important results from each conflict area. We considered such an overarching communication would be important in order to offer an overall view to all participants of the conference. On the other hand, we also wanted to get into conversation with the coordinators themselves, because they are and were, they were and are involved in the development of these areas from the beginning. So thank you again. Um, with this, I would like to give the floor to our experts proceeding in the order of the program. I would like to conduct this round table proceeding in such a way that each speaker has more or less five minutes with the first reflection, reflection on what has been presented in uh, the conflict areas and mainly what has been perceived as future, uh, as future uh, uh, regulation and, and, and problem solving strategy. And in the second round, I think we would discuss a little bit on uh, the perception, perception of the World Heritage Convention either 50 years or not as much as 50 years. I'm aware that this question contains a wide range of possible answers, uh, but it is precisely diversity that matters to me. And I'm sure that, you know, in the variety of different backgrounds, uh, we will have a very interesting, a very interesting presentation here. Uh, compared to the other, uh, to the other presentation, we will, the presentations, we will summarize the discussion here separately and prepare them uh, to our platform and also to social media. So let's start with Nicole Franceschini, coordinator of co-coordinator of the conflict area global governance. Nicole, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Albert. And yes, we actually had a wonderful morning, early afternoon all together discussing global governance. And I think what, what we can say all together as the group that were there this morning, but also the result of the think tank is really that global governance in relation to the convention is at a crossroad. We see that there are many challenges. Among these challenges, we have the weakened multilateral cooperation. We see much more the national interest overcoming within the context of the convention and instances of politicization. And we see these both at the level of working processes with the World Heritage Committee, as well as compliance when it comes to decision um, and decision making within the convention. And here notes were made specifically in relation also to the over focus that currently exists on the nomination process and the inscription process against the actual aim and principle of the convention, which is deeply rooted in aspects of conservation and protection. And here also another note is that the essence of the convention itself is not just about listing properties as much as in creating a platform for international cooperation in protecting these places that are important to humanity. We also had the chance and we moved on and discussed the aspect that the system is facing new challenges or they're not very new, but they are in some way and in some context new, especially when it comes to decolonizing procedures, but also in becoming more aware of narratives that have been long um, not listened to, not been heard. And this has been, um, thanks actually to Irene Fogarty, something that has been put a focus, as well as uh, Christina Cameron, apologies, on um, decolonizing and indigenous people, especially the recognition of indigenous understanding of the world, world views and knowledge, and the big divide that still exists between the aspects such as the OUV, the 10 criteria and the thresholds of the 10 criteria that seem not to be in line with actually offering indigenous people a potential for participation in indigenous led nomination. We do have outstanding examples, Pima Chowinaki and Buj Bim, but of course the, the hope for the future is that there will be rooms for revising criteria for inscription and thresholds, as well as creating more capacities within the advisory body to better understand nominations that are um, indigenous led in a certain way. 
we looked at governance in many different ways. We actually had um, also a look at diplomacy in relation to global governance, the role diplomacy has, the role that digital diplomacy is having today. The, we are in the age of Twitter diplomacy, and I think you know we had we had four years of U.S. presidency where Twitter overcame any other type of diplomacy to a large extent. And this has been also a very interesting prospect to look at in relation to governance and in relation how cooperation, but also the interaction between different parties has taken place and is taking place. Not only in the negative way, there's also some positive sides. We can have a much bigger impact as civil society through social media. And so we can find a common ground to harness this new potential. We had the chance to look at the emerging of new indexes, of new processes, the World Heritage Index that uh, Eike Schmidt actually presented, which is an overarching analysis of periodic reporting from 2010 to 2012, looking specifically at um, governance and management issues. And this has been really an insight to see um, governance system compared to one another and possibly a really good tool for um, the future. We looked then at civil society, of course, in discussing global governance, something that we've all brought the attention to is that there is a huge space now that needs to be taken up by civil society. Within World Heritage, we do have the World Heritage Watch, the Our World Heritage Initiatives, who are actually immensely contributing in trying to raise awareness on what really is of importance and what really matters. Also trying to raise awareness on the need to um, strengthen the World Heritage system, both in terms of resources, in terms of uh, monetary resources, but also in terms of capacities, as well as the need to really reconsider and discuss again some of the principles that are there. And here I really want to cite something that is, was particularly interesting from Christina Cameron to really the need to look holistically at values and really try to reconnect that aspect of outstanding universal value, international designation with local values. And not to try to divide them and say who's more important against another, but to really try to bridge the gap, finding also new ways to protect places. And I will conclude here because you will actually have the chance to read more about this. But uh, thanks to Marita Corveza and Christina Cameron, we had, an, we had identified 10 um, key challenges that we'll need to address. And they run from uh, the need to rethink the system of designation, also looking at landscape designation, looking at planning, territorial scale planning, climate change being a very big challenge. And I think Claire will talk extensively about it in a minute, but also to look at issues such as um, adaptation, resilience, building capacities, education, and sustainability, also in connection with integrating or being more aligned with the 2030 agenda, but also the rise of digital technology and what this can allow us to do. The final note has really been in global governance, something that needs to be understood and needs to be enforced is really accountability when it comes to the World Heritage Convention. And we're not yet there, but the wish is, if we had one wish, it would really be to strengthen accountability in relation to state parties, but also all those involved in implementing the, connect, the convention. And I hope I did uh, justice to everyone who spoke this morning and thank you very much. Nicole, thank you very much. This was really interesting. I have only one question. I have only one question. Was there any positive uh, reflection on the 50 years, on the past of the 50 years? Yes, I think, you know, the, the first positive reflection is that we are currently here, there's more than 60 of us, and we're here brought together by the convention. It is a convention that brings people together. It's a convention that at the level of governance is raising more question marks than anything else. I think what is a positive take out of the day we spent together today and the think tank is the aspect of seeing civil society so motivated in protecting places and really trying to make a change yeah. despite the many difficulties we see more and more organizations Absolutely. working no longer together but with one another to really try to make a change in the agenda and i believe that in in the past 30 years this is the most positive time we're in in trying to introduce civil society more strongly within the system this sounds really good and is encouraging thank you very much next one is matthias rip 
Matthias Ripp is coordinator. Matthias Ripp is coordinator of the urban transformation section and Matthias, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Marie-Therese. So we, we uh, dived deep into the topic of urban transformation, which is uh, like a new scientific concept that is really embracing a systemic understanding of change that is happening in the city. And it can be separated from urban development in the way that it includes also change in the urban systems that is not always desired. And we had a really interesting row of presentation with different case studies and some of the presentations also more on the conceptual level and the conflicts that we encountered were in several of the cases related to the different uses of the urban fabric. We had examples like uh, gentrification of places, like for example, in Berlin, uh, I was just there last week, the Tacheles. I mean, it became such a, it's, it, it will become a synonym for the gentrification, I think, very soon because the development is so massive. And in a way, it's like uh, the contradiction of good placemaking. It's like uh, a negative impact of placemaking. We heard an uh, interesting presentation on the conflicts that are related to conflicts of values between colonial values and local values in Africa. And that was also very interesting because we also questioned there the role of museums as institutions. I mean, is it like the, the right way to, to do like linear narrative based storytelling or should we rather do more things together with the communities in a participatory way to really redefine and include also values from today in this whole section of uh, heritage. We heard from Dennis Rodwell uh, a very nice term that I want to repeat here, what he called the crisis of the definition. So it's all about uh, the question what belongs to heritage and it has started as we all know with a lot of physical heritage and today it has become much broader. And of course, that is a lot of consequences that have not been foreseen in the World Heritage Convention but in the operational guidelines, they have reacted in a way to these challenges during the last years, but maybe they are not at the end. We heard presentation from Krakow, how the city has changed in relation and after the designation to the uh, World Heritage label and what effects that had for the locals. Mm -hmm. And we also had a very good presentation on the capital of culture and other mega events where basically every in all of these cases cultural heritage is like the setting and the resource that is used for these projects so and of course they also have a lot of negative consequences but also positive consequences it's like a mixed bag and maybe an overall line of all the presentations that we heard was that we have to look more into the what Dennis Rodwell called the, the human factor. We have to take more into account the role of humans in this whole system. And maybe we don't need another recommendation or another piece of paper or another guideline or an, another list of things or another toolbox. But maybe what we need is rather to do some capacity building and enable the, the people and the key actors, and maybe we can even call them agents of change on the ground to, to really go forward with this new understanding as we have already heard from Nicole that really the role of the local community is at the forefront today and we cannot go back beyond that. So maybe for a start, this is a little summary what we have discussed this morning. You have any questions for me, Marie Therese? Yes, I have one question, um, Matthias, thank you very much. You know, the reflection on a human factor, this is a very, very, very important, and we should have that in mind because, you know, in our Institute Heritage Studies, we are discussing this issue since more than 10 years, I think. Uh, but my question is, and this is always a problem we are, uh, which, we, which we are facing is, you know, this does not, is, this does not, or is, is not really involved in the idea of the protection of world heritage. 
how this yes. can or should be done. Maybe we can discuss, discuss this later, but this is from my point of view, a very important issue. Well, one point that we found out not only here, but in, in parallel projects is that when we embrace more and more heritage as a system, what yeah. we can do is to enable the, the people who work in heritage to understand the system. Yeah. And it's more like general training things we need to do than rather getting trained in how to deal with the specific material things or something like that. So I think the general trend should be more to re-enter the helicopter mm -hmm. to get a good view of what is included and not to land the helicopter and take out the small glasses and look for the tiny details. This sounds really great. And it's a promotion of your new book, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Matthias, thank you very much. So You're the welcome. next one is Alexander Siegmund, Technological Change. Yes, he is already here. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Albert, for the possibility to make some summarize of the presentations we had this morning. So beside the, the keynote, we had some five very inspiring, interesting uh, talks about different regions and about different top topics in the context of the use um, of uh, different technologies. We started with the uh, mineral extractive industries in the context of European world heritage, where we have learned that uh, the technological change itself is, is part of the world heritage because many of these sites are world heritage sites because they stay for some kind of, um, let's say, technological status of, of their time, um, which, is to pro uh, which is protected now. Um, we, we switched over to the, the possibility of modern uh, technologies of visualization um, of the of the visual property of UNESCO sites uh, on the on the on the on different examples uh, by by Michael Klose, mm -hmm. uh, where he explained how a proactive tool uh, could or should be developed uh, to to protect or yeah protect the world heritage against uh, getting on the red list of uh, or the red list of uh, world heritage in danger or get, get out of the list of world heritage sites. So to use the technology in before something negative happens, and there are different examples like the the uh, the bridge in 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 Dresden and so on. Um, the next uh, talk was about uh, the change in water technology in Anatolia, uh, about the use uh, from energy and con conflicts and climate uh, based on based on that. So sustainable development on the one hand side protection on the other hand side. So these uh, different concepts, which are both uh, relevant and valuable. So protection of something, but also sustainable development. Mm. And sometimes these are in conflict to each other. Uh, and the last two talks um, uh, by, by Mario and colleagues from uh, University of Ghent was about digital geo heritage to support heritage authorities. So this was about the use of modern geotechnology like LIDAR and remote sensing uh, to monitor, to visualize, uh, and, and to, uh, this way also to protect uh, different sites. And the last talk uh, was, um, was about the use of uh, new age technology for sustainable tourism in world heritage sites uh, in the COVID area and maybe beyond uh, mm -hmm. with some uh, case study of, of Greece. Um, and there we also have discussed critically the, 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 the dark side of the coin of uh, modern technology, where we have discussed that in the times of uh, social media, people just run to a site, make a photo, send it to the world, and that's it. And don't, yeah. maybe don't go too, in, too deep inside uh, the, the background of the sites and the historical value and things like that. So at the end, to, to summarize, um, there are many opportunities and, and many chances in the use of modern technology for the prevention of UNESCO sites, for their um, to, to make them visible, to make them accessible, even on, on, on non-present and in, in not being in presence, but also getting uh, valuable insights in different sites where you are not able to go, not because of Corona, because but they are far away. Um, but we also have to discuss this, this uh, critically. So not every, every technique is valuable by itself. It also is, uh, can just also just be so valuable 
as the use it can be to pro prevent and uh, promote and um, get uh, world heritage accessible. Um, another another output of, of the discussion was that it needs uh, awareness about the pot uh, possibilities of new technology. So many people even don't know what is possible. And so if, if they don't know, they are, are not able to, to evaluate, to, to balance uh, the pros and cons of the use of this technology. And to, to do so, you need education and training uh, on, on, the, on the site uh, level, on the authorities which are responsible for UNESCO sites and, and other uh, not, not just World Heritage, but I would enlarge this, this topic on biosphere reserves, geoparks, and other natural heritage, because they're all challenging the same things. And if you don't have the, the knowledge and the awareness about the potentials, you are even not able to express your needs mm -hmm. uh, and your demands uh, and in the use of these technologies. So technology is not the solution, but it can help if you know about it, if you know the pros and cons. And if you are able to at least express your demands or maybe use them by yourself, at least on a, on a basic level. And this is uh, the, the, therefore you need education and training. And that is what uh, you, you knew, the new UNESCO program, Education for Sustainable Development to Achieving the Agenda 2030 is all about. Uh, education and training is the basic for all sustainable development because you need all this knowledge on different fields uh, to achieve these uh, global sustainable goals. So that was mainly the, the abstract of our, of our session. <laughs> Mr. Sigmund, thank you very much. I remember, you know, I remember when we started to discuss the technological development, we had a similar discussion and uh, your expert said, you know, why you always say this is, uh, this is dangerous and, 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 and difficult. We have also positive effects. And these positive effects, I think uh, maybe we can focus on. And this one of the positive effects is, is uh, uh, precisely the educational development. Here I have a question. Do you see a chance in the implementation of, let me say, in schools or universities is, is easier, but in schools, for example, to implement you know, the, the, the ESD uh, Gs uh, for sustainable development uh, in, the, in, the, in the near future? There, there, there are many, not just opportunities, but uh, needs to, to do so, because the uh, future generation is that a generation which is sitting in the schools, but also in, on universities. These are the stakeholders and decision makers of tomorrow. Uh, and if, if not then, if not they, who else should uh, get sustainable development in, in, their, in their genes? Uh, so we, we, have, we have to do it. And there are many opportunities to do so. There are and it's a huge amount of um, education material, uh, of training material, of workshop uh, offers on, on the market in different languages also, not just in German for sure, but in, in, in English and, 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 and other ones. And as, especially in Germany, but I, I, we, as we have uh, created a unit twin network uh, out of six UNESCO chairs who all work on education for sustainable development from, from Canada via Costa Rica to South Africa and, and back to Germany, um, we, we, we are recognizing that um, the, the aspect of sustainable development is, in, in, is an increasing demand by the young people, especially by themselves. If you look on surveys on that, they ask for uh, uh, sustainable products, they ask for sustainable production. And if you look to the promotion in the television, at least in Germany, every second pr uh, promotion uh, in the television is telling something about how our product is sustainable. If, it's, if it is or not, but they use this uh, uh, to promote their product, which means that this is, uh, this is a social process which is going on and we, sh we should rely on that and we should uh, try to, uh, to, to support this process. That's right. Thank you so much. Next one is, uh, let me check, is Friedrich Schipper. Friedrich Schipper, you know, we had a meeting this morning and uh, please, the, the floor is yours. I hope he's still there. There Hello. he is. Hi, Friedrich. Yeah. <laughs> my my okay. camera was blocked by. Okay. <laughs> Technological developments. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So, uh, the conflict area, war on terrorism, um, is uh, so far particular in the context of the World Con Conference because it's the only conflict area where human life may be directly and definitely at risk. 
And as always, when you are talking about cultural property protection in the event of armed conflict, uh, at some point the question raises, you know, uh, the protection uh, of monuments and sites versus the protection of people. So we also raised this question in the course of our session. It's very clear that uh, in the context of armed conflict, human lives are first and the protection of people and protection of civilians as a priority, but protecting heritage also means protecting people because it's uh, uh, certain, um, in, the, in the first instance, a, a heritage also relates to people. And secondly, uh, in the modern era of identity wars that we face today, in the past 30 years, so to say, uh, we face, we witness cultural cleansing of whole regions or cities or so that goes along with ethnic cleansing. So cultural property protection, the protection of heritage in armed conflict definitely relates also to the protection of people. Uh, we also concluded that cultural cleansing or the destruction of cultural property uh, makes it difficult uh, to uh, um, go for reconciliation after conflict, uh, to plan rehabilitation of uh, uh, displaced people in the original areas. A particular aspect that we talked uh, about in several papers uh, that we listened today uh, is that, uh, frankly, in, in the conservation of sites, uh, it is a decade-old state-of-the-art principle uh, that you, and on the one hand, uh, uh, preserve all levels of the history of a site or monument. On the other hand, uh, you uh, refrain from uh, uh, restoration or too much restoration. Uh, in terms of sites and monuments that are damaged or destroyed in armed conflict, uh, this level of destruction means a new level. And uh, we have to reconsider how to deal with that because uh, this level of destruction uh, constitutes or uh, generates uh, trauma scapes in a way that are also part of the history of a monument or a site. Uh, and in this context, uh, we witnessed uh, throughout the past years also, and then we were referring to the period after World War II, we witnessed uh, uh, the attempts to re definitely reconstruct uh, monuments, like uh, uh, we were talking about Palmyra uh, and uh, the so-called uh, um, uh, Triumph Arch yeah, that, uh, um, and, and other examples. Uh, and although uh, these um, ideas are against the principles, for example, of the Charter of Venice or so, um, the community is definitely considering to rethink about how to approach uh, in, in this respect. Um, an additional aspect in cultural property protection event of armed conflict is also that not just monuments and sites may be damaged or, dis or destroyed, uh, but movable, prop uh, prop uh, movable property um, he falls definitely victim to looting, uh, partly large scale looting and the easy trafficking in cultural property is a huge challenge. Uh, also to aspects of security because uh, the income of this easy trafficking uh, generates uh, money that can be reinvested in conflict. This leads directly to the issue of law enforcement, um, uh, which is still, uh, and, and, and penal measures in the context of uh, cultural property protection conventions, law enforcement and penal measures are still a weak point and remain a weak point. We talked a lot about a new convention uh, in this respect, the Nicosia Convention, uh, which still lacks uh, multiple signature or, uh, 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 instruments of ratification. Uh, if I recall it correctly now, uh, correctly now from the talk, but six or eight European countries have ratified the Nicosia Convention so far. It's very limited. And law enforcement remains one of the uh, big deficit uh, topics in this respect. Mm -hmm. uh, no wonder that also in our um, um, session, education was one of the big topics, yeah? whether it's education uh, for school children or education for practitioners or for professionals or for the military or uh, law enforcement, uh, but also in, our, in the paper about um, terrorism uh, and Islam, um, the speaker pointed out that, uh, for example, Islam and the tradition of Islam is not at all 
against heritage uh, on the country. Uh, the Quran, the Holy Scripture of the Muslims itself is considered heritage and also the Kaaba in Mecca is considered heritage. Uh, and uh, the position uh, that uh, out of religious reason, uh, you can act against heritage and, uh, and aggressively and destroy it uh, is simply a matter of lack of education. Mm -hmm. uh, we also include, uh, concluded, especially in our conflict area, uh, that uh, the protection of heritage is highly a matter, not just of interdisciplinarity as far as science and uh, scholarship is concerned, but also of transdisciplinarity. Otherwise it would not work. You have to bring it into the practitioners field, into operation, uh, whether it's politics or policy making or the military and law enforcement and art search and so on and so forth. Friedrich, thank you very much. I have a little bit of provo pro provocative question. <laughs> you know, everybody is talking about education. Everybody says we need education. In your specific field, what do you think what kind or content or, or, or structure or whatever education is needed? You know, you have so many target groups involved, much more than in any other conflict areas we have discussed today. So you have to include education everywhere. But if you have yeah. to focus, uh, what is what is what is what do you think where you have to start? Well, well, my point of departure is uh, training for military and uniform personnel. This is where I work because I'm also deployed as an expert officer to the Theresian Academy, for example. We talk a lot about how to reinstall training and education in this sense, because uh, throughout the past decades, and we look down, uh, back to World War II, for example, we had this kind of training and awareness also in the military uh, in regard to cultural property protection. and. Uh, um, in the past decades, uh, let's say with 2003 as a marking year uh, when, the, when uh, the invasion of uh, Iraq occurred, uh, we realized that the military simply had, had lost its competence and military around the world is trying to reinstall this kind of training. Uh, what military did throughout most uh, of the countries is um, to train specialized personnel. Um, Nevertheless, during an operation, I mean, thousands and hundreds of thousands of soldiers are operating and basically uh, uh, cultural property in the concept of military should be um, uh, approached like any other topic that officers and non-commissioned officers and uh, soldiers should observe. Yeah? Uh, basically, every soldier uh, deployed into action has to have a minimum knowledge about cultural property and cultural property protection. That means you have to implement an information in the basic soldier training. You need courses already at the non-commissioned officer academy, uh, uh, and you need repeated training at the uh, commissioned officer training uh, academy, at the uh, uh, general staff academy, uh, at all levels of command, uh, and especially when people, when, when soldiers uh, are getting deployed uh, internationally, they need a kind of special awareness and uh, information and training uh, on the area where they are deployed. Thank you, Friedrich. Thank you very much. So, and now we come to Claire. Claire Cade, she is the coordinator of the climate change area. Welcome, Claire. <laughs> How are you? Hello, Mary Trace. How are you? Thank you so much for doing very well. Um, yeah, we had a lovely morning, so I just want to thank all the speakers and presenters that joined us this morning. We had a great diversity of talks. Um, so just to think, actually, the, I think that, as um, Nicole mentioned earlier, um, values was a big issue. So four of the themes that emerged, I would say, that sort of um, blossomed out of the talks this morning is thinking about the concept of outstanding universal value and the impact that climate change is going to have on that. So in, in one area, we have the conflict between OUV and the climate actions that we might need to put in place to either mitigate against climate change or to protect world heritage sites from the impacts of climate change. So then when we put these protective measures in place, how might they then affect the authenticity of a site, the integrity of the site, and ultimately the outstanding universal value? So the big question I think is how much change can we allow at World Heritage Sites? How can we manage the change that is, is coming down the path or, or is already here from um, climate change, particularly 
in dealing with the whole issue of climate change, we have to consider at a society level, a whole transformative change if we really want to make any difference to how the temperatures are increasing. So then we can go a step further from thinking about the impacts of climate actions and consider well, what actually happens when we lose a heritage site or when a heritage site loses its outstanding universal value. So maybe there's a direct impact on a heritage site that could, you know, from coastal erosion and um, sea level rising was mentioned. Maybe in the case of a natural site, you know, the endangered species or the vegetation shift and the, the, they leave the protected area. So then we really have to think about all the mechanisms that we have in place in the World Heritage process and to how to deal with this. So there's, for example, the list of World Heritage in danger. So when a site is threatened at the moment, we put it on this list and we have a call to arms and we ask all states parties to assist in protecting the site. But as one of our speakers, Cathy, highlighted, is that putting a site on the list of World Heritage danger means that it's amenable to correction. So we see a path down the line where we can fix the threat. But if we've lost the OUV, what does that mean? And is it fair to delist sites that have lost OUV, particularly in the more vulnerable countries. So if you think about maybe the global south, where they might be hit hardest by the impacts on World Heritage sites, but then it's, it's the uh, industrialized countries in the north that are creating all the greenhouse gases and causing all the problems. So then it's out of the control of the people that are losing the sites to climate change. And so is it really fair, you know, with that um, concept of climate justice and um, what do we what do we do in that instance? Um, and another presentation, we brought up the age old conflict of economic development against conservation. And this time we were talking about tourism. So we all know that World Heritage Sites, by their nature, they attract tourists. But a big contradiction here is that the tourism sector now is responsible for you know, a large proportion of global gas emissions, which contributes directly to climate change, and climate change is a direct threat to World Heritage Site. So we had a, a fascinating example from the case study of um, Sagamartha in Nepal, and where we can see the impacts of climate change directly on the glaciers and the hydrological systems that are in place, but that there's a huge demand for tourism and tourism is seems to be unregulated in the area and it's causing huge problems. So it, I suppose that tourism is a big question. How are we going to, what is sustainable tourism and how are we going to manage it down the line when we really have to take serious action against greenhouse um, gas emissions? Um, another conflict we're thinking of, we have to start thinking beyond the boundaries of the World Heritage Sites. So we had a very a nice example from Argentina. So the whole question about you know, um, a protected area and it's closed off and people are excluded on the outside, maybe thinking some of the issues that were raised earlier about um, colonization, colonialism, um, that we have a legacy where historically people were excluded from or ev evicted from protected areas. So now those communities are cut off, um, their economies, the social values, everything is separate from the protected area and they're excluded. So we really have to think about that because World Heritage Sites can't exist in isolation and they need to be connected to the wider environment. So in this instance, um, there was a lot of research done and scientists came and instead of concentrating all the science and research within the protected area, they looked outside the protected area and found all sorts of new species and all really exciting stuff and people suddenly became aware wow, we have biodiversity too, this is really interesting. They got engaged, they got involved. And, uh, you know, it was um, a, a long and difficult pro process, but it was really worthwhile. We also had examples of where World Heritage Sites can lead in, in climate actions. We had a great example of the historic gardens and how they have a lot to teach us about climate change. So if we consider them as um, living monuments of expressions of um, human culture and history and that people can really relate to people these gardens for recreation there's an opportunity for education and welfare and they're a great example of all the impacts that uh, climate change can have on a space and similarly we had um, examples of how using climate vulnerability index and how that's been applied in sites in um, in Africa so again examples of world heritage sites leading the way in trying to address some of these problems so I think the big, um, I suppose the big lesson is that we're going to have some serious debates ahead 
about the implementation of the World Heritage Convention and the operational guidelines and how we need to think about how all those tools are applied in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. This is precisely the result I want to hear. <laughs> 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 good, maybe, good. <laughs> maybe we can make a next step. The time is running, so therefore, okay, thanks okay, a sorry. Lot. <laughs> um, no next one is Thomas Schmidt with this uh, with this uh, uh, conflict area commodification. Thomas, yeah, thank you very much. Um, we had also a very inspiring and very enjoyable discussion, I think. And we considered both cultural and natural sites and had case studies from Latin America, from Europe, and two from East Asia. Tourism, as mentioned by Claire also, uh, was certainly the main focus of our contribution. And there were also relationships uh, to the topic of urban transformation, surely. Uh, but the topic of commodification goes far beyond the topic of tourism. It's much more bigger. So, since not everyone might be acquainted with the concept, I might be, uh, begin with a brief, short explanation. So commodification means to make something into a commodity, which was not treated as a commodity before. And commodification changes the relation between people or between people and things, artifacts at the heritage sites in fundamental ways. It encompasses, according to Karl Marx, exploitation and alienation. And now the question is, what does this mean, exploitation and alienation mean for world heritage sites or for world heritage as a whole? So it can mean that the site or its title is used for someone owns financial or other symbolic capital interest without caring about the title, about, about its heritage values. Also people and the natural environment can be exploited. And there is also a danger of an alienation between people and the site and between people and as visitors and local residents. So, so what does it mean alienation to a site? That means that people don't have access in a mental meaning to a site and its significances or heritage values without the possibility of either identification, the one key terms of our conference, or instead of identification, but it's also okay, a critical appropriation of the site. So alienation comes especially through specific kinds of representations of the site in a commercialized way. Um, one example, if we look at the, uh, we have all seen uh, thousands of times in our life world heritage sites, at least in pictures. So, so we might know them all very well, even if we have never been there, or even if we have only superficial um, information. And that's a little bit the problem that that we don't uh, normally we, we don't go to the original cultural values or natural features. So, in the technical terms, the heritage values of the site. And also, if we if we look at some book projects presenting one heritage site on two pages, they get uh, from the World Heritage List, they get they give me only superficial information. So what's here a solution strategy, good media, uh, good books with in-depth information and also teaching project as you has done, I think, Marie Therese with the transboundary project uh, of your institute. So in our case studies, we looked at different markets, uh, especially at the tourist markets in which um, World Heritage plays a role with all the problems we know, at least in general, environmental degradation, overuse of a site, uh, social cultural problems, alienation. And uh, however, it was quite interesting to see, um, to, to have an in-depth look in, in the specific configuration of the case studies. And, what do we have here for solution strategies? So we have, in a conceptual mode, we have quite good solutions for decades. We have concepts of soft tourism. We have the soft. Uh, we have the concepts of ecotourism. We know how to regulate, at least principally, the problem of tourism. But now the question might be, why it is still a problem? Yeah. 
And, and uh, the answer to, to this question is that we don't have a, a problem of knowledge or of general insight, but a problem of implementation and of specific insights at specific place. And what comes also to this problem area is the big number of quotes in tourism, in global tourism, which uh, has grown with a factor of five between 1980 to uh, 2018. So, so this big, so this increase uh, uh, is perhaps the, the biggest problem that all this concept can't uh, be really um, uh, come to a solution. But we must say, if we hadn't this, these, uh, all these concepts, the problems at many sites would have been much more bigger. In the case studies, we had different oh, insights. Yeah, interrupt you. <laughs> sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry, time is running and okay. we have only 10 minutes left and I have to give my conclusion. <laughs> okay, so, so, okay, okay. Because I wanted to ask all of you one yeah. question. We are talking about 50 years World Heritage future. What has to be done? One sentence. Thomas, you start. <laughs> okay, so, so, but then I leave my topic. Uh, and I would say, this is one of the biggest problem I formulated in a, in a book uh, 10 years ago is that <laughs> the World Heritage uh, bodies don't, are able to, aren't able to treat with valuable sites which aren't on the World Heritage list. And this, is, this might be one of the biggest problem of the World Heritage Convention. Okay, next one. Who is the next one? Claire. Claire, you're still there? Oh, sorry, yeah, I just really forgot my camera was off. The question was, you have understood the question. Okay. Yeah, so well, I just think one of the strengths of the convention at the moment is this, the community that we have created and the network of professionals. So we need to continue that, support that and keep that to the future and hopefully we can overcome all the challenges ahead. But one question, what about the convention? Or oh, the convention, yeah, we seriously need to look at the operational guidelines, and that's a strength because they can be, be changed. So they are always a lot evolving alongside the scenario. So we really need to think about what is OUV and how we can incorporate wider values that will allow some change. All right, thank you. Friedrich. Friedrich Schipper. We also have to look on the operational guidelines of the other conventions and uh, uh, compare uh, these guidelines uh, in terms of cultural property protection, world heritage, uh, the interfaces, of course, world heritage in danger and joint venture as a joint venture of, uh, let's say, UNESCO, ICOMOS and Blue Shield, uh, considering operational guidelines for joint missions, but also for joint training and for the development of uh, further tools. Thank you very much. Alexander Sigmund. I would say uh, closing the gap between techno technological possibilities and application, uh, and the gap can be closed by education and training and awareness rising. Uh, so not just some experts should know what kind of modern technologies and how to use, but also um, UNESCO site and UNESCO stakeholders themselves should be able to know about the techniques at least at least and what the potentials could be out of them. Thank you. Matthias. Well, I think it's a good idea to uh, adapt the operational guidelines to embrace more really the human factor that is inherent in, in heritage always. And one, one idea would be, for example, to include a more specific definition of the roles for site managers with the corresponding skills and to develop like a, a range of capacity building activities to really enable the people that are part of heritage to have a better understanding and a wider understanding to implement all these things that are coming down the road, like sustainability, resilience, adaptation to climate change, etc. Great. Thank you, Matthias. Nicole. I think, I mean, of course, I have to go to the operational guidelines like everyone else, but I would say it's a matter of, it's a long overdue, massive update of the operational guidelines that goes from criteria to including local communities in a more systematic manner to actually aligning the operational guidelines with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People with the Human Rights Declaration. But I also do believe that we have done one step ahead and I believe that this will be the future of the convention is strengthening capacity building 
places like the Site Managers Forum, the World Heritage Site Managers Forum, where every year we see a hundred site managers coming together and exchanging with one another, exchanging with the advisory bodies, has become an incredible place to build the capacity of an entire system. And these are the people that can change the system from the bottom up by making a point within their state parties to their focal points of what are their needs and what are the needs of the convention. So I truly believe capacity building will play a key role if we want the convention to celebrate its hundredth anniversary. Nicole, thank you very much. You know, I thank you all. I think this was the outlook. <laughs> we can stop it here. But it's, it, I, I would say, I would like to say some words. So thank you very much to everybody. And I come to the conclusion.